Be not ashamed. You know, from the time we're old enough to know right from wrong, we're capable of feeling ashamed or shame. But until we're old enough to know that we did something wrong, there is no shame, right? I guess ignorance, there is no shame. The Greek and Hebrew words from which our word in the King James Version Bible, ashamed, are translated, often mean confused or confounded. And you know, when you think about it, that makes sense. Because confusion or being confounded usually leads to shame or being ashamed. Take a little kid. I wasn't going to do this, but let's, let's take a little child, for example. Three years old, okay? He's, you know, his job in life is motoring around looking for stuff to get into. You lay it out on the table, that youngster's going to get into it. He comes along one day and he finds a book of matches. He doesn't know that there's something wrong with playing those matches. He hasn't been told. So he's a playing with them and checking it out, you know, well, what's this good for? Well, it doesn't make a very good toy. I wonder what the food value of it is. You know, they, you know, taste it and check it out. But then the parent notices what's going on. And of course, then it's the parent's responsibility to set the child down and explain to them why it's dangerous to play with matches. I mean, at first the parent was a little bit shocked, you know, and angry. Oh, you don't play with matches, you know, and the child's at that point confused himself, you know. Well, what a, if, if they're that dangerous, why did you put them down here where I could get a hold of them, you know. So uh, that's kind of the way it is, too, with our father. If we're not in the know and if we're ignorant of his word, it's awful easy for us to be confused. And confusion leads to shame, as we'll see today. We're going to start in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to take a look at some types, you know, the Old Testament. Uh, of course, a lot of prophecy there of the end times as well. But today we're going to take a look at some types for people that were ashamed and see if we can figure out what caused those people to be ashamed. And then we're going to go to the New Testament and see how we ourselves can keep from being ashamed, especially in our Father's eyes. So with that, let's start in Genesis. We're going to start pretty close to the beginning of it all, as it's written, anyway. Chapter 2 of Genesis. And let's pick it up with verse 15. And the Lord God took the man, this is Ha'adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. This word dress means to work. And as we learned in verse 5 of this same chapter, there was no man to till the ground when Ha'adam was formed from the clay. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. You see, God's being like that parent that told that child not to play with the matches. He's, he's getting a commandment here. Now, pick that up too, that word commandment. I guess you could call this the first law that's written in the Bible. Of all those trees out there, Adam, you can partake of them. But there's not a period there. Verse 17, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's that old serpent, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And again, that was a law. As we learn in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, One day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. So God kept his promise here. Methuselah lived to be 969 years old, the oldest man recorded in the Bible. That's less than a thousand days. So in the day man partook of that tree, he did die. Verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them into Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. I can't help when I read things like this to think, what, how much fun would that have been to be Adam? I mean, you know, bring it in, that's a cow. From now on, that's a cow. That's a horse. You know, Adam, Adam must have been running out of names though when he came up to aardvark. <laughs> I mean, just think about it, you know. Remember now, he was naming them in Hebrew, of course, but there's an equivalent word in Hebrew for aardvark, I'll assure you. Or that there's a duck-billed platypus. I mean, 
he was running out of names, you know, when he got down through all these animals. But I'm sure that was a lot of fun. Verse 20. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. This word meat is the Hebrew neged, and it means a counterpart or a mate. So God's told Adam, you know, you can partake of all these trees. And gosh, Lord, that was a lot of fun naming all those animals, but I'm still kind of lonely down here. 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman. The Hebrew uh, for this made means builded he a woman and brought her unto the man. What would Adam think? And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman in the Hebrew, Hebrew Isha because she has taken out of man, Ish. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one, be one flesh. Well, you know, that's some real good marital advice. Did you, did you overlook that in that verse? A man shall leave his father and his mother. You know, I know a lot of young couples these days don't have much of a choice about it and have to, for economic reasons, live in this, under the same roof with their father-in-law and mother-in-law or their parents, as the case may be. But it's not made for a good relationship. And as soon as you're able, get out and get that one flesh as being one uh, family separated from that. And that's some good marital advice there. Yeah, I hear problems all the time from the other. Verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They were not ashamed at this point, and you can say, no sin, no shame, right? But there's one problem with that. Think about it. Do you sin? I sure do. So how can we keep from being ashamed? Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 49. How can we keep from being confused and confounded? Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1. Listen, O isles. When you read O isles, you can pretty much say that's the whole wide world, every bit of it. Unto me, and hearken, ye people from afar. This is the Gentiles, Israel, everyone. Listen to what I'm saying. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. Well, who's talking here? Is this, of course, named from the womb of his mother? That could very well, that could be Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. But wait a minute, we're in the wrong book. This is Isaiah. Could it be Isaiah speaking? No. What we'll see here in a minute is called from the womb and named in chapter 7, verse 14 of this same book, Emmanuel, God with us. And you'll notice, most of you with companion Bibles, that the personal pronouns and the, the speaker that follow are capitalized. Some of you with other King James Version Bibles, they may not be capitalized. But let's go a little further and my point will become clear. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Well, that sounds like Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. His tongue is a two-edged sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Israel, what does Israel mean? He will rule as God, is what Israel means. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. The first advent, Christ was rejected. And I'm sure that he felt much of his efforts were for naught and in vain. It's the people rejected him as well as John the Baptist. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work or my reward with my God. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob. And automatically when you hear Jacob you should always think all twelve tribes again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, better translated, that Israel may be gathered to him, and I may be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, 
and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Better said, lighter than thou shouldest. That's, that you can do more than that. And to restore the preserved, the elect, if you will, of Israel. I will also give thee for a light. Who is the light? John 1.12, I am the light of the world, Christ speaking. To the Gentiles, or nations, that thou mayest be my salvation. Anybody want to take a hazard of what that word salvation is in Hebrew? Yeshua. Unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One. To him whom man despiseth or scorned, to him whom the nation abhorreth, they spat upon the cross. To a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship because the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. He hath chosen thee, better translated. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time, and John declared this acceptable time for us in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, the price had been paid on the cross. I have heard thee, and a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant might say a new covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritage. Is, this word desolate means ruined. And you know, most people's inheritance is ruined in this time. Those 10 tribes that went north over the Caucasus Mountains and settled later in Europe, Great Britain, Canada, the United States, have no idea who they are. No idea who they are. They've lost their inheritance, if you will but you're in his will if you claim it. Verse nine, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth, go forth where? Freedom, the truth gives freedom. To them that are in darkness, what is darkness symbolic of always in the Bible? Death, come, come out of the darkness, come out of death to the light. Show yourselves, they shall feed in the ways and their pastures shall be in all high places. Are you being fed? I hope so. Verse 10, they shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Let's flip over real quick to Revelations chapter 7. There's somebody else that said almost those identical words in Revelation. Revelation 7, let's pick it up about chapter 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And of course you know these white robes are the righteous acts that make up our clothing in the millennial age. Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. How do you wash your robe? It's called repentance. And these that came out of the great tribulation are the overcomers. Therefore are they before the throne of God. Man, can you imagine? Right there before the throne of God. And serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more neither shall the sunlight on them, nor any heat. Words of our Lord. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed him, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away tears from their eyes. All tears wiped out. So, we've got some choices coming up here in a little bit. We've got this not being hungry and being by the living waters in the fountain, boy, it looks to me like everybody would choose that way, but we'll see here in a minute. Verse 11, And I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. God will make it easy for you to come back to the light if you'll just make that little bit of effort yourself. 
Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. This is ancient China. Sing or shout for joy, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy or compassion upon his afflicted or humble. What happened? But Zion, or Jerusalem, said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. You know, in Genesis 28, God promised Jacob, I will never leave thee or forsake you. But in chapter 1 of this, it states that Judah forsook God. And here they're turning the tables and saying, God forsook them. Verse 15, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I, Yahweh speaking, not forget thee. You're more, I mean, God's love is stronger than maternal love is what he's saying. Mothers might forget the child of their womb, but I will never forget you, is the promise made. 16, behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Wow, this is God speaking here. He has graven you on the palms of his very hands. Thy walls, or the hedge of protection, are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste away from the darkness and back into the light. Thy destroyers, including Satan, and they that made thee waste, shall go forth of thee. Addressed to Jerusalem in verse 18. Lift up thine eyes round about and behold. All these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord. That's God swearing on himself. As I live, saith the Lord. Thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all, as with an ornament, and bind them on thee, as a bride doeth. But remember, there's two weddings. At this point, there's already been one wedding, and there's already been one bride, and that is the bride of Antichrist. 19. For thy waste and thy desolate places. How, are, how was Jerusalem laid waste and desolate? by the abomination of Antichrist, setting up house there to rule. And the land of thy destruction shall even now be too narrow or too small by reason of the inhabitants, and they that swallowed thee up shall be far away, right in the pit. The children which thou shalt have after thou hast lost the other, Companion Bible does a lot better translating this, of whom thou bereaved, or thought you had lost, shall say again in thine ears, The place is too straight for me, too small. Give place to me that I may dwell. There's so many sheep coming back into the fold that they're saying, Hey, this is Jerusalem, you're too small. Then shalt thou, Jerusalem, say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these? Seeing I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro. And who hath brought up these? This brought up in the Hebrew is gadal, and it means to become large. Behold, I was left alone. These, where had they been? Where, where did all these people come from? Is what Jerusalem is saying. 22, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, the nations, and set up my standard to the people. The standard, you know, is the post with a flag on it. And God setting his standard up here is a point for the nations to focus on. And he's saying, you bring my children right back here, right here, right now. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. If you take this back, better translated, they'll carry you in their bosom with their heads reclining on your shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, or foster fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Whoa, we got a good clue there of how not to be ashamed. Wait for the Lord. 
Those that jump in bed with Antichrist are ashamed, folks. They will be. But it's just like that child, the first time they played with the matches, they're not ashamed at this point, but they are sure confused, I'll, I'll guarantee you that. Let's go on over to Jeremiah chapter 17, and we're going to take a look at a couple more types of some folks that were confused and ashamed. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1. The sin of Judah. Now, what, let's talk about the sin of Judah for a minute. What are we talking about? idolatry. They were worshiping other gods. The sin or idolatry of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. Whoa, those are two pretty hard objects there. Iron, is that pretty hard? Diamonds, pretty hard? Well, where is this idolatry written? It is graven upon the table or tablets of their heart or their mind and upon the horns of your altars. And the altars, that's where we're supposed to be worshiping, Yahweh. And their idolatry is written on the very place that they're supposed to be worshiping God Almighty. And boy, I'll tell you what, I'd hate to have that etched in my mind, because if that's etched in your mind, I'll tell you, you sure don't have the seal of God in your mind. Verse 2. Whilst their children remember their altars, this is better translated, as they remember their children, they remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. They're pagan shrines. O oh, my mountain in the field, again this refers to Jerusalem, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. There's coming a time when God will allow you to be confused and just go right after Antichrist. Verse 4, And thou, even thyself, or of thy own self, shalt discontinue, or remit, from thine heritage that I, Yahweh speaking, gave thee. And this reminds me of Esau. He sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger which shall burn forever. You say it's going to burn for a little while? That fire of anger. and I mean, think about it. What, what did they do that made God so angry? They broke the very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. They broke the second commandment. Thou shalt have no graven images. So, uh, the same fire, though, to those that love and serve him is what? The Shekinah glory. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, arm being symbolic of strength, and whose heart, or mind, departeth from the Lord those that apostatize, those that fall away from God and His Word. For he shall be like, now who shall be like? This one that's cursed, that's trusting in man rather than trusting in God. For he shall be like the heath. Now a heath is like a little uh, desert juniper. And it's, it grows out in the desert, and just as quick as it gets up and there's enough little growth that it starts feeling like it's doing pretty good, a mountain goat comes along and eats it off. So a heath is not something you want to shoot for. And shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. Boy, you remember that place we read about in Revelation where we're led by the living waters, that there's plenty of pasture all the time, that we've got the Lamb of God right there and we have God wiping the tears away from our eyes? That sounds like a whole lot better place to me than this salt land. Is there a choice? Let's see, verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh. The fire of God, that Shekinah glory, won't hurt those that fall into this category. 
But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful or fearful in the year of the drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Now changing notes, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. This is saying the mind of man is evil above all things when he puts flesh first rather than trusting in the Lord. 10. I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, Christ said these very words, almost word verbatim, to the church of Thyatira after they were uh, jumping in bed with Satan. Verse 11, sharpen up for me here, As the partridge sitteth on eggs, and hatcheth them not. And what this is getting at, this word hatcheth, actually, if you take it back to the Hebrew, means begat. So this partridge is sitting on these eggs that she didn't lay. So they're stolen eggs, okay? So he that getteth riches, and not by right, shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. So just like the partridge that steals those duck eggs and light sits on them until they hatch, what are those ducks going to do when they hatch and see a partridge there? They're going to head on out. So just as those ducks would forsake that partridge, so will the riches of ill-gotten gains forsake those that partake in them. Verse 12, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. That's Yahweh's throne. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee or relinquish thee shall be ashamed or confused. And they that depart from me, this is a cap, Yahweh, shall be written in the earth. Whoa, written in the earth. And you actually, if you took this back, can translate it in the loose earth. How long would your name written in the loose earth last when a good shower comes along? Not very long. I'll tell you what, where I want mine is in, in heaven, in the book of life, as recorded in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain, capital F in most Bibles, of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. So, we can forsake him and be ashamed. He's not going to forsake you, but you can sure forsake him. And you're out of the will then. You just lost your inheritance if you go forsaking the Lord. Or you can trust in him and be healed. Let's take a look at some real ornery guys. We're going to flip on over to Jeremiah chapter 22. And I'll tell you what, Judah was in a world of hurt for kings. And we're going to take a look at some of the bottom of the barrels just as a type of what we should not do, and then we'll get into some good news about what we can do to keep from being ashamed. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 10. Weep ye not for the dead. And what Jeremiah is referring to here is King Josiah, who was killed in battle. And the people were still mourning over this king's death at this time. So he's saying, don't weep for your king Josiah. I mean, I know, you know where he's at, or you should know where he's at. He was a just and righteous leader of the people, a just and righteous king. He's right here with me, the father. Neither bemoan him, but weep sore. Don't just weep, weep sore for him that goeth away, for he shall return no more, nor see his native country. And several points here, Jehoahaz, uh, as recorded in 2 Kings 23.30, was selected by the people to replace King Josiah. In fact, indeed, he was his son. But this weep sore for him that goeth away is also in reference to the people. Under the leadership of the future kings which are coming, Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. Verse 11, For thus saith the Lord, touching Shalem. Now, Shalem and some scholars disagree about why Jeremiah referred to Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz, excuse me, here as Shalem. 
And many point to the fact that his name probably was Shalem to begin with. Shalem means retribution. And what uh, Jehoah has received was surely retribution. Shalem, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who reigned in, which reigned instead of Josiah, his father, which went forth out of this place. He shall not return, neither any more. But he shall die in the place whither they have led him captive, and shall see his land no more. And what happened was Pharaoh Necho uh, uh, took him into Egypt, and that is where he died, never to return to his land. He was the king of Judah for all of about three months. Now we're going to switch gears with verse 13, and it starts referring to Jehoiakim, which will be documented here in a minute. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work. Now what we got going on here is Jehoiakim decided he needed a big palace, and that if he had a big palace, he'd be a good king of Judah. Let's see. 14, that saith, I will build me a wide house, a great big one, and large chambers, and cutteth him out windows, and it is sealed with cedar, and painted with vermilion, a very bright color. Now understand, this was after uh, Pharaoh Necho uh, appointed, uh, okay, let me back up. It's kind of confusing because there's so many different names. Eliakim was the given name of Jehoiakim, okay? But when Jehoahaz was uh, taken away captive into Egypt, Jehoiakim, or actually Pharaoh Necho himself, appointed Eliakim king of Judah and changed his name at that point to Jehoiakim, okay? Anyway, you want to look at it, we got a partridge sitting on duck eggs. Let's just put it that way, okay? That's what we got here is a partridge sitting on duck eggs. Continuing on, verse 15. Shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? You got this big, bright, painted house. Is that going to make you a good king? Did not thy father eat and drink? Your father enjoyed life, but still, and do judgment and justice, and then it was well with him, and also with the people of the kingdom it was well. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy, and fairly, I might add. Then it was well with him, was not this to know me, saith the Lord. To do righteousness, to do right, is to know the Lord. But thine eyes and thy heart are not but for thy covetousness. Boy, you remember what we read back in chapter 17 about the mind is deceitful above all things? And that's what happens when we get going on flesh and greed and let this covetousness take over. Well, I mean, it can become unbelievable what it will do. And for to shed innocent blood and for oppression. This oppression, I mean, he was working people and not paying them their wages. And for violence to do it. Not only that, but he would you know, cause people to be condemned so he could throw them in prison and then he would take their wealth so that he could add on to his palace. 18, Lord wasn't happy about it. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament, there won't be any tears, for him saying, all my brother or all sister, not even his own family is going to weep. They shall not lament for him saying, O oh Lord, Ah, Lord, or ah, his glory. No one will care. No one will mourn. It'll probably be like, you know, that uh, little boy wrote in and he said, Pastor Murray, he said, I asked my granddad what they were going to be doing in heaven after Michael cast Satan out, Revelation 12, 7. And his granddad, he said, my granddad told me they'll probably be saying, thank God and greyhound he's gone. Pastor Murray, is that true? And Pastor Murray kind of said, well, yeah, that's kind of the way it is. That's the way it's going to be exactly with old Jehoiakim. It'll be, thank God and Greyhound, he's gone. 19, he shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. What's right outside the gates of Jerusalem? That old pile called Gehenna? 
in the Greek, which means hell. 20. Go up to Lebanon. Now this is talking about the mountains that surround Jerusalem basically here. And cry, and lift up thy voice in Bashan, and cry from the passages, for all thy lovers are destroyed. All the allies of Judah had been taken captive by King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which means confusion, as you know. 21. I spake unto thee in thy prosperity, but thou saidest, I will not hear. This is the Lord speaking. When did he speak to them in their prosperity? You ever heard of the song of Moses? Deuteronomy chapter 32. Well, we should all be pretty familiar with that because that's the song hopefully we're going to be singing. Let's flip over there real quick. Deuteronomy 32. Remember he said, I spoke to you in your prosperity. Song of Moses, chapter 32, verse 15. Deuteronomy 32, 15, I should say, the Song of Moses. But Jeshurun, now Jeshurun, if you take that back in the Hebrew, means extremely happy, waxed fat, and kicked. This is a term, Jeshurun is a term God used for Israel when they were in their good time Charlie rolling right along days. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick. Anybody care to take a stab at what thick is? If you take it back, it's abba, and it means to be dense or stupid. Thou art covered with fatness, this being fatness of the world. Then he forsook, this gesture run, forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed. This lightly esteemed is nabal, and it means fall away, the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods, small g, whom they knew not, to new gods, small g, that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, notice the capital R, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. So there's Jeshurun, and you know, that's typical of our people. When things are going good, you hear people saying, look what I did. Look at this nice big house that I built. Boy, I am surely good to have such a fine house. But what happens the first time something goes wrong? Immediately they're turning around, Lord, why did you do this to me? Why did you do this? But they're forgetting him. Okay, let's go back to chapter 22 in Jeremiah. And back in verse 21, where he said, I spake to thee in thy prosperity, but thou saidest, I will not hear. This hath been thy manner from thy youth, that thou obeyedest not my voice. The wind shall eat up. Now this is, if you take it back, the storm that is about to break will eat up all thy pastors and thy lovers, your leaders and your allies, shall go into captivity. And of course it's talking about the captivity immediately to King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. But then also we can look at this prophetically of the captivity that is coming with still the king of Babylon, if you will, king of confusion. Antichrist. Surely then shalt thou be ashamed and confounded for all thy wickedness. O inhabitant of Lebanon, that makest thy nest in the cedars, how gracious shalt thou be when pangs come upon thee, the pain as a woman in travail, birth of a new age. Now we get to another king of Judah. As I live, saith the Lord, again swearing, though Coniah, now this is Jehoiakim, which Jehoiakim, they suspect he changed his name from Coniah uh, to Jehoiakim, so it would sound more like his father who was Jehoiakim. But his father wasn't somebody that you'd want to emulate yourself after, I don't think, you know, ending up on the pile at Gehenna. Though Coniah, or Jehoiakim, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet. Now this is God talking. If he were a signature ring. What's the signet? You know, the one that makes the impression if you're signing something on wax around a letter. 
If he were the signature, my signature rune upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence, pluck it off and throw it away. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, means confusion, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. Those that are confused or confounded will go into captivity. There's no other way around it. They're ignorant. They don't know God's word. They don't know that Antichrist will return before Jesus Christ. And they will go into captivity. How can we keep from going into captivity? Let's go over to the New Testament. Epistles of John. First epistle of John, chapter 2. Just before the book of Jude, John, epistles of John, of course, being written by the same writer of St. John and Revelation, for the most part. John means Yah's gracious gift. Let's pick it up in chapter 2 of first epistle of John, verse 18. Little children, I love the way John wrote so tenderly, little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. You know, how do we know? It's Matthew 24 tells us. 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. These are the Antichrists speaking of. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued. This word continued is meno in the Greek. You're familiar with that in John chapter 14 where it's talking about the mansions with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest or made known that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction. You know what this word unction is in the Greek? It's one you, most of you probably know. Charism? What does that mean? It's a gift, right? But ye have a gift from the Holy One and ye know all things called spiritual discernment through the Holy Spirit. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth. You, you know the truth about Antichrist, but because ye know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore, let what therefore, let's see, abide or mino, dwell in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. Well, what was from the beginning? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue or abide in the Son and in the Father. You know, this is something you don't have to wait on. You know, a lot of people, uh, I've heard sermons preached on, oh, in my Father's heaven there are many mansions, and boy, I can't wait to get there. That's something you don't have to wait for. That's something that's promised to you today. If Jesus Christ is in you and you in Him, you can abide with him right now. You don't have to wait to pass away to be in that mansion. 25, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Boy, what a promise. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, those that would attempt to seduce you through false teachings. Remember, there are gonna be two weddings. Which one are you going to? But the anointing, oh, here we have that Greek word charism again, the gift. But the gift which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing or gift teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, Abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Well, you know, there's going to be a lot of folks that claim to be Christians 
when that seventh trump sounds and they realize that they have made one big mistake, it's written, there will be gnashing of teeth. They will be praying for mountains to fall on them. They'll be knocking at the door of that bridegroom saying, Lord, Lord, we've taught in the streets. We've healed in your name. He'll say, get out of my sight. I never knew you. 29, if ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. You know, there are some at that point, well, let me back up, from the time that the tribulation of Antichrist begins until the seventh trump, there are going to be a lot of folks trying to make you ashamed. Let's take a look at uh, what's written of that in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're getting close to concluding here. 1 Peter chapter 4, and that's just over in front of John there. First Peter chapter 4, let's pick it up with verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Why should we not think it's some strange thing going to be happening to us? Because we read about it. Mark chapter 13, Ephesians chapter 6. What, what, what is that in Ephesians chapter 6? The gospel armor. What do you put it on for? To stand against, it says fiery trial there, but it's also like to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. And that's another, you know, people are always asking, you know, well, prove there is no rapture theory. Ephesians chapter 6, boy, does a real nice job of it for me. I mean, being a pilot, I know that the lighter something is, the easier it flies, right? Why would you want to go putting on the gospel armor if you're going to fly away? You know, doesn't make any sense to me. So, I don't know about you, but I'm staying here and putting the gospel armor on and going to be right here. Verse 13, But rejoice, or be cheerful, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Whoa, whoa, that means I'm going to share in Christ's sufferings? Do you mean I've got a, they're going to put one of those thorn crowns on my head and, and make me drag a cross up Golgotha and then they're going to crucify me? No. Doesn't mean that at all. You see, there's not one of us that's worthy of that. He paid that price. It's written to touch my, mine anointed. Yes, we need to prepare ourselves for these events, but anybody that's getting ready for a physical combat you're barking up the wrong tree. Touch not mine anointed, God told Antichrist. You cannot touch my anointed. The two witnesses, yes, will be slain in the streets, as is written in Revelation chapter 11. But the rest of us, folks, get ready for a spiritual war. It's not a physical thing. And besides that, when, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, yes, Christ did that for me. I'd be happy to do it for him. I'll tell you what, watch out what you ask for because you might get it that when his glory shall be revealed. When is that? The seventh trump. His glory will be revealed. You may be also glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached, this means chided or taunted, for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of the glory and of God talking about the Shekinah glory here, resteth upon you. This word resteth means refreshes. So as you're being taken up before the synagogue of Satan to testify and you're being chided and taunted, what do you call on for strength? Call on that spirit of glory and of God that will refresh you. On their part, now we're talking about those that would chide and taunt, he is evil spoken. In the Greek, this is blasphemeo. Care to take a guess at what that is in English? Those that he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. 
Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, and I'm going to clarify that by saying a follower of the true Jesus Christ, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf, this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? This gospel of God, uh, you might make a note if you want to make a little further study on this. Appendix 140 of the Companion Bible goes into the various gospels. But basically what the gospel of God is, is about Christ crucified and resurrected, is what the gospel of God is about. 19, excuse me, 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Pretty low on the totem pole. And I say to those people, come out of the darkness. Come to the light. Come to truth before it's too late. 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And one last verse to conclude. Many of you probably know where we're going. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, and it reads, Study to show thyself approved. This word approved means acceptable unto God, a workman. Notice that says workman, not a faith man, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed or confused, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, study to show thyself approved. Yes, I know we're all busy and we have a lot to do in our lives, but what could be more important than spending a little time every day studying God's letter to you so that you can be approved unto God? Your very eternal life may depend on it. So, those that wait on the Lord won't be ashamed. Those that give up their inheritance by forsaking God will be ashamed and will go into captivity to the king of Babylon, or confusion, if you will. So, you have a choice. You can either trust in the flesh man, or you can trust in God. Those that trust in God won't be ashamed. Have God in you, and you in Him. Abide with Him. The Greek word meno, it is. So, if you have that, then you won't be ashamed. And believe me, there will be a lot of gnashing of teeth and praying for mountains to fall upon them when the true Christ returns and many are in bed with the Antichrist. Father, let's go to the throne. Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this platform that allows us to turn the hearts of the children back to you, Father. And just as it is written, the angels in heaven rejoice at each one of these children, of your children, that return to you, Father. We at the chapel also rejoice at each one of these, Father. We thank you for eyes to see and ears to hear, Father. We thank you for the wisdom to where we can go into these latter times and not be confused, Father. And again, we thank you for that platform that helps to reach out to your children. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. 
Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 1.46 Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. The book of Deuteronomy. The law was given as our schoolmaster. Have you been to school on God's Word? Certainly one way to go there is to study the book of Deuteronomy. Probably the most, the most exciting thing that Deuteronomy has to offer for you is that great song of Moses that those that overcome the false Messiah in the end generation will be singing. The law itself being the schoolmaster that keeps us out of trouble in these flesh bodies. Again, an education in taming that part of you that oftentimes needs taming through the old schoolmaster, that great book, Deuteronomy, the law, and its set ways of keeping you from harm's way even in this generation. You're going to enjoy it. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.